Today I'm going to be talking mostly about the NIST tab. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the details of, of the various measurements that we've used, but what I'd like to do is give kind of a larger overview of sort of the program of the NIST MAB, sort of how it's become uh, the commonly accepted reference material throughout the community, and really talk a little bit more about the life cycle and quality plan of the material. Um, happy to, of course, get into the details of some of these analytical methods um, and questions, but I thought it'd be better for this talk to, to really give sort of a high level overview of sort of how the quality is maintained on this reference material and a little bit of the background and resources that are available. But sort of aside from a lot of the uh, scattering and neutrons and macro scale measurements, but more a little bit on the line of uh, the, the more commonly accepted, well-characterized biopharmaceutical methods that are more routine in uh, characterization and quality control of these materials. So we'll start off with a standard disclaimer that I'll probably show some values today on the slide. You'll see some numbers, but again, note that there's always a reference material certificate. We call this the reference material information sheet. Uh, this is available online at any time. So if you do want to check numbers that are specifically associated with the material of interest and for a specific lot of the material, uh, which in the next four or five years, we'll actually have a new lot coming out. I'll talk about some of that in the future, but always just please refer to uh, the, the current online data rather than these uh, proposals or these presentations to look for values associated with uh, any of our reference materials. So I thought in the links consortium, we talk a lot about length scales. And so I thought it'd be good to start off with a little bit of analogy and a little bit of a geography lesson because uh, of course, uh, while uh, many are good with geography, I personally am not the best with geography. So sort of starting out from where we are, uh, of course, we start on planet Earth, of course. We can get a little bit more granular at our smaller length scale and zoom in on the United States and even in Maryland, uh, which is where we're located here on the East Coast. If we zoom in a little bit more uh, on the state of Maryland, you can see the uh, national capital of the United States, Washington, D.C., and we are actually located just north of Washington, D.C., uh, here in Gaithersburg and Rockville. Uh, the actual NIST site is in Gaithersburg, and the lab that I operate is actually at the Institute for Bioscience and Biotechnology Research, which is just a little bit south of there in Rockville. So zooming in a little bit closer on the geography now in the Gaithersburg-Rockville area, I pointed out a number of uh, very important landmarks for the biotechnology industry. Of course, I actually have not gotten all of the small companies and even some of the bigger companies in the area located here. But the point of this really is to say that NIST is really uniquely positioned geographically amongst a, a real hotbed of biopharmaceutical development in a broad variety of uh, materials. So monoclonal antibodies, CAR-T therapies, viral vectors are all being manufactured and developed uh, in the area around Gaithersburg. So we're really uh, uniquely positioned. Of course, I've also pointed out a couple of other very important landmarks. We're surrounded by a number of wonderful coffee shops. So we have a, a Black Lion coffee shop near uh, IBBR. There's a couple of Starbucks around the area as well. And of course, if you think about geography, if you wait long enough, for example, let's say you're home for a couple of years during a global pandemic, you might see another Starbucks popping up here and there, and you'll get another and another and another to say that even our geography as we go to work every day changes. Um, actually driving in this new company where Gen X Bio uh, literally built their building in the last couple of years. And so we really are uh, a growing and budding ecosystem. In addition to biotechnology, uh, wonderful coffee shops to uh, keep us all fueled. So I give this long geography to lesson to say that monoclonal antibodies also require many scales of measurements. And of course I put this scales in parentheses to highlight that it's not just the length scales of the scattering measurements, but really the types of information that you're getting out of various measurements. So of course you can think about macromolecular structural properties, dynamics uh, with things like cryo-electron microscopy, various modeling techniques, et cetera. You can look at a little bit more detail of the uh, monoclonal antibody and start looking at subunits. So you've got of course fragment antigen binding domains. You've got the fragment crystallizable region, heavy chains, light chains. And essentially you can start to really parse down this molecule into smaller subunits. Of course, you can dig even deeper. Uh, we've got a number of post-translational modifications to different amino acid residues here we've identified with peptide mapping. There's, of course, disulfide bonds in each of these individual subunits, disulfide bonds that hold them together, and as well as glycosylation. There's also biophysical properties of these materials, sort of global charge heterogeneity, size heterogeneity. There's a significant amount of complexity in addition to uh, higher order structure 
uh, of these molecules. It really needs to be characterized. And of course, the last but not least, stability. So stability is something I think we all need to really consider, not only in our measurements, but in understanding our molecules. And of course, I'm putting here a figure of various modes of uh, aggregation that can occur to these molecules, but keeping in mind that individual amino acid residues can degrade, they can have chemical, uh, chemically induced post-translational modifications, they can degrade during storage, degrade during handling. So really understanding sort of the, the stability properties of, of your molecule are very important. So fortunately for us, the NISMAP was designed uh, to be uh, very stable and uh, is a very robust material to be used for uh, analytical characterization. The other point of this story about looking at these various measurements and sort of different ways to think about measurements for monoclonal antibodies is that the toolbox of measurements is always changing. And this is actually one of the impetuses for beginning the NISMAP reference material is that the landscape for measurements is always evolving. So daily you'll see a, you know, a new report, a new mass spectrometer, a new HPLC that can give you higher resolution, higher performance. And so we really need some sort of test metric to follow this evolution of analytical methods and really understand the capabilities as they evolve over time. So taking a little bit of a step back and uh, talking a little bit more about NIST before we get into uh, the reference material. So NIST is actually a non-regulatory agency within the US Department of Commerce. So we don't actually regulate biopharmaceutical products, but we do contribute technology, measurement science standards, uh, and really innovation with our biopharmaceutical partners to try to really enhance the economic security of the United States, improve the quality of life through advanced measurements and uh, facilitating development of these biopharmaceutical products. So we do this program in biomanufacturing uh, that started roughly uh, eight or nine years ago. Uh, the program of course has developed that measurement science and standards associated with biopharmaceutical manufacturing and characterization. So in this mission, we work very closely with our other federal stakeholders to really understand the challenges of the biopharmaceutical community. We work with instrument vendors quite a bit. And of course, we work with the biopharmaceutical community to try to tackle those measurement and standards challenges that face them every day. So to do this, we draw on a very broad uh, array of expertise. So of course, you have folks like myself that are analytical chemists, but we also have a wide variety of uh, expertise in uh, formulation, higher order structure measurements, um, things like cybersecurity. There's even a fire research department at NIST. So uh, we have a very, very um, complex set of expertise that we can draw upon. And I think last but not least, and I mentioned this before, we really are non-regulatory. So one of the advantages that we have is we can work very openly with our stakeholders and we're not worrying about an intellectual property uh, uh, concerns associated with the products that we're measuring the technologies we're developing. So we can really try to benefit the uh, community as a whole, as opposed to working on a, a specific product for a specific company. So NIST, as I mentioned, has a pretty broad array. And of course, we're talking about biopharmaceutical manufacturing today. Let's get a pointer up here really quick. So of course, we're talking about biopharmaceutical manufacturing today, but there are a number of other programs in industrial biotechnology, regenerative medicine, and again, many, many, many other programs um, that uh, could be discussed that are related to uh, the biopharmaceutical manufacturing. So the reason we're able to get our hands in so many different areas uh, of important to industrial commerce is we have a, a large uh, infrastructure for this basic research as well as applied R&D. So we have a significant amount of infrastructure for measurement for various biomolecules from proteins to DNA to metabolites. We have large uh, infrastructure for uh, cell-based measurements, uh, growing cells, bioreactors, and we're building out more and more bioanalytics to help measure the processes of biopharmaceutical manufacturing. So the essence of this is really we do have a large measurement infrastructure, uh, many, many tools that one would envision uh, to be used to characterize biopharmaceuticals, as well as many innovative tools uh, are available to measure a wide variety of properties of importance for the community. So we often use these uh, fundamental research tools to better understand the standards needs of a particular uh, industry. And we'll develop a physical test metric, perhaps a documentary standard uh, to facilitate then characterization or some uh, mode of industrial commerce. So a couple of examples that I put over here, uh, there's a genome in, in a bottle consortium. Uh, this actually has developed a, a DNA material that's useful for uh, calibrating and understanding the depth, accuracy, and precision of next-generation sequencing. 
So we have a number of uh, bio-related materials that can help with things like PCR and MGS. Uh, but also we have the NIST monoclonal antibody, uh, another one that I'll highlight today and we'll talk about mostly, uh, which of course is intended for the biopharmaceutical community. So again, these are just representative. Um, you can find a, uh, thousands of reference materials uh, at our uh, reference material shop um, online and sort of peruse them. There's actually recently a YouTube video as well uh, that I should have highlighted today. Um, if you, you can find it, it popped up on NIST that talks about the reference materials program uh, in a much more broad perspective. And you can really see the diversity of materials from homogenized meat products to uh, Sharpie pens, all the way to these uh, biopharmaceutical related manufacturing standards. So the program in uh, biopharmaceutical measurement science specifically, uh, we do this in a number of ways. Of course, again, we, uh, as I mentioned before, we collaborate broadly with the industry. We have a broad uh, set of expertise and we really apply this to a variety a wide variety of modalities. So we're really talking about monoclonals today, um, but we've uh, initiated programs in viral vectors, RNA vaccines, and cell engine therapies. And we're really attempting to apply these advanced measurement technologies to, again, a wide variety of modalities that uh, can be useful for different indications. So of course, this is just a very representative um, number of companies and, and agencies that we work with. Uh, this is uh, by no means anywhere near exhaustive, but just to give a representative uh, indication of the fact that we try to work as broadly as possible across the uh, community. So as in the previous slide, again, we have basic research, mission-driven uh, product delivery, and uh, try to actually apply our R&D. So diving a little bit deeper into the some of the measurement infrastructure that we have available uh, that we've applied to our monoclonal antibodies, Again, we look at things like protein stability. Uh, this includes uh, biophysical type measurements, um, looking at things like, of course, neutron scattering, SACs, Raman, um, viscosity, and other fluid-based properties. And one thing I wanted to point out is uh, a, a large amount of current infrastructure surrounding submicron particles uh, that's actually been done in our bioprocess group. And they've actually developed a reference material that's available to uh, calibrate and understand those microscale um, particle measurements. So protein structure is the area that uh, our, our lab falls in and uh, uh, quite a bit of material uh, research has been done on the NISMAB material. Uh, so my group in particular does uh, mass spectrometry and separation science. Uh, there's a group at NIST that has extensive mass spectrometry based libraries uh, on this material as well as many, many other materials. It's one of uh, NIST's most widely used uh, products. Uh, the group at IBBR under John Marino has done a significant amount of higher order uh, structure research and, and a number of you folks have touched base with this group in the past. They look at a number of things like HDX mass spectrometry, which is hydrogen deuterium exchange, nuclear magnetic resonance measurements of uh, higher order structure, and cryoelectron uh, microscopy. Uh, my group and others do things like binding activities, so surface plasma on resonance and IC ITC. To really understand the bioactivity of these molecules in sort of an in vitro setting. And of course, uh, other protein folding and a significant amount of work of simulation that again, uh, some of the NIST experts are contributing to the LINCS consortium uh, in this area. So last but not least, one thing I won't talk too much about today is our uh, production cell science group as well. Um, so we're really getting into expanding some of the principles of the NIST MAB and reference materials to cells. Uh, and literally within the next few weeks, uh, we'll actually be releasing our first living reference material. Uh, this is being developed by Zvi Kelman and Brad O'Dell uh, at NIST. And this is actually a CHO material that will express the NIST map. So it's a non-originator version or the CHO NIST map or C NIST map. Um, so essentially it should have the same salient uh, amino acid sequence, but of course it's expressed in a different CHO host. So we're calling it a non-originator uh, material. But the cell line will really sort of extend the properties um, or the principles of, of the NIST map and sort of harmonizing and better understanding measurements from just the physical material all the way up into the bioprocess. So I think we'll see a lot of innovation around that material uh, in the coming years. So I've been talking a lot about reference materials. Um, so taking a little bit of a step back to talk about reference materials. Uh, there is a, a NIST special publication that talks a lot about sort of the tools that we use, uh, how we characterize reference materials, and what sort of categorizes uh, as a NIST reference material. So the term standard reference material is a little bit confusing. Uh, the United States calls these standard reference materials. 
The rest of the world calls them certified reference materials or CRMs. But if you think about an SRM, it's the same as a CRM. So these are well characterized in the measurements that we report on our reference material uh, inferences with certificates of analysis. All sources of uncertainty are accounted for. And typically, there's traceability to a fundamental unit to the SI. So think that we're tracing a measurement of concentration back to the definition of a kilogram, so we can really understand very accurately and precisely uh, that uh, the measurement of, let's say, concentration is very, very accurate. And it's done using typically a certified method. A reference material, on the other hand, is, of course, still homogeneous and stable with respect to the properties that we're measuring, but some uh, points of uncertainty may not be fully discernible. And you'll see in some of the analytical methods that we use to characterize these material, they report things like relative abundance or populations, and they may not necessarily be tra traceable to an SI unit of mass, and hence these are typically uh, referred to as reference materials. But it's important to note that all of these materials are produced under the same quality management consist uh, system in accordance with ISO uh, regulations. And of course, these materials are sold on a cost recovery basis. So we're not for profit, we are part of the US government. So essentially the amount of money that's put into a material needs to be uh, recouped by the federal government to basically support uh, continuous monitoring of the materials and development of uh, new reference materials to again support uh, commerce. So there is another um, type of material that actually grew a little bit out of the NISMAB and we'll see in some of the life cycle management work uh, that's called a research grade test material. And so these are materials that need to get out of uh, NIST quickly. They need to be available to the community quickly uh, to develop measurements that are of, of great need. So NIST does a limited quantity of homogeneity and stability um, and puts that material out uh, into the wild, into the public for additional use to evaluate its material properties, sort of inform NIST on what additional measurements may be needed. And eventually those RGTMs will uh, graduate, if you will, into a uh, NIST reference material. So moving on a little bit to monoclonal antibodies uh, as a standard, I think I talked you know, a little bit about some of the um, complexity of these materials, um, starting to think about the various aspects of post-translational modifications, linkages with disulfide bonds, um, things like post-translational modifications, including glycosylation, um, and of course, higher order structure. So you can really think about uh, monoclonal antibodies as, as you know, a very complex mixture of very highly similar species to one another. But of course, every monoclonal in this mixture is not the same. So think about all of these possible permutations in the single individual molecule, and you can tell that it's cousin molecules that are next door may have different levels of, or different oxidation at different points. They'll have a different glycan attached. It could be folded in a different manner. So it really is a heterogeneous population of very similar molecules. But one thing you can think about, even from a specific monoclonal antibody of the same sort of constituent amino acid sequence, um, is that although it's very heterogeneous, all monoclonals that are, of course, of the same class have very similar properties as sort of a general platform approach. So all of them have post-translational modifications. All of them have the same general structure. They all have the same canonical disulfide bonding pattern. So as a class, they actually share a lot of the same attributes. So in thinking about a measurement standard that can be used to sort of understand, harmonize, and evolve analytical measurement technologies, you actually can use one molecule to really understand the performance, at least initially, of an analytical method. Of course, you'll need more monoclonals to understand whether that analy analytical method is broadly applicable or platformable, but at least understanding the initial characteristics and the fundamental performance metrics of an assay can really be done on a commonly accepted, well-characterized molecule. So around 2012, uh, we actually started to uh, talk to the community and ask them about making a reference material. This idea actually grew out of uh, a number of glycoanalytical methods that uh, I was developing in NIST at the time. And the thought, again, from uh, talking to the community was that, you know, everyone should be using a common standard. It would be great to have a large amount of this material that we could all share and discuss analytical performance methods. And of course, the more robust methods we have, uh, the better off. And of course, we could develop those methods better and better and better if we had a shared understanding, a shared test metric uh, that we could all discuss. 
in an open environment. So the vision of the NIST map, of course, was that we would have a publicly available biopharmaceutical grade material. So of course, we didn't want this to be a regulated product. We didn't want it to be something uh, that was actually a therapeutic uh, marketed on the drug on the uh, the market for use in patients, but we wanted it to be representative of one of those drugs. So the idea is it's an open innovation material. It's voluntary, not something that people are required to use in order to develop an actual drug product, but something that can facilitate developing their measurement infrastructure along the way. So we wanted this to material to be very exhaustively characterized and not just at NIST, we really wanted to get the industry and the community involved in the characterization. So the first thing we actually did with this material was we sent out uh, the first lot, uh, which is actually called primary sample uh, 8670, which many of you uh, have uh, used in the past. So this material was actually shipped around to about 100 participants who uh, essentially characterized the material using a wide variety of assays. In most cases, we actually tried to recruit um, a number of laboratories running the same analytical method. So we had everyone run their platform peptide mapping assay, for example. They would come back together, discuss the analytical results, and then write a chapter about it. So the ACS books are really sort of a culmination of both background on the current state of uh, characterization, and by current, I mean in 2015, um, along with a series of data uh, that characterizes this molecule with just about every analytical technique that was available at the time. So this is a wonderful place to start um, if you're looking for uh, you know, what a number of the state-of-the-art analytical methods are. And they have certainly changed over time in the last five years, but I think a lot of the principles and sort of this foundational uh, characterization data for this molecule uh, really still, of course, holds true today. Uh, and gives a great overview of, of the types of analytical methods that are used to characterize these materials. So following the ACS book, of course, um, and uh, you know this, this foundational characterization, uh, NIST, of course, then had to assign materials to this value, make it then more broadly publicly available, and I'll talk about that uh, in the next couple of slides. So the uses of this material, I think, really are broad, and I'll try to cover those today, but um, you know, sort of a vision for it, it really is to address shared challenges, uh, advance analytical capabilities uh, to better understand their performance metrics, and really evaluate sort of, I call this the regulatory readiness, but, you know, how appropriate and where to implement a particular measurement tool. Because you don't only need measurements at lot release before it goes into the drug, you need measurements during the process, you need it during development, you need it during understanding the properties of the material far before uh, the commercial stage of manufacturing. And not every analytical method is well suited to being a lot release assay, but its importance can still be uh, very great in understanding material properties, looking at stability, monitoring the reference standard for a particular material, et cetera. Uh, and we hope that the, uh, the NIST map can sort of help to define where and when to use uh, certain analytical methods. So a little bit about the uh, life cycle management. So I had mentioned in the previous slide that we did the uh, uh, community-wide crowdsourced characterization as part of the ACS uh, book project. So again, the material was actually received at NIST at 100 mg per mil uh, in these uh, Sartorius set in large bags. So we actually took one of these individual bags and diluted it out, and we call that plot primary sample 8670. So this material was used for the ACS books. Uh, this material was used for method qualification that I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and it's used for internal research. So when I say internal research, I say uh, initially, uh, and especially when we need high concentration materials, primary sample 8670 is the go-to. When you need low concentration materials, we'll actually use the reference material because again, that is the material that's broadly available to the rest of the community. But the reason that we had this primary sample was of course, so that one, we would have material quickly available for the ACS books. So this is analogous to what we would now call a, a research grade test material, but also this becomes our internal primary reference. So the 10 mg per mil version of 8670 is reserved for NIST internal use only, and only as part of the measurement infrastructure to maintain the quality of this material. So this is actually modeled just as a biopharmaceutical company would do, we have a primary reference with which we always refer back to as 
and suitability to understand the material properties. Now to make commercial material, uh, we actually mixed a number of these individual bags and we did this on purpose uh, so that we would have a large supply of the material that was homogenous and didn't have batch to batch variability. So we didn't want over the long term to have to make new batches of this material um, that uh, would eventually uh, potentially have different, uh, different properties due to batch to batch variability. So we homogenized um, uh, a large quantity of material that we had, uh, aliquoted that out into one liter segments at the 100 mg per mil. And each of these now one liter containers can be, be diluted tenfold into an individual lot of what becomes a commercial reference material. So this widely available uh, 10 mg per mil, 800 microliter per, uh, per vial is actually what one can purchase from the NIST uh, website. And this is the official material that's called a reference material 8671. So we initially prepared three lots of this material. Um, we're keeping our full life cycle uh, available on these materials doing continuous monitoring um, that I'll describe in the life cycle plan below. But again, we also have multiple of these uh, one liter materials available that we can always dilute and vial more uh, RM8671. And because again, they were homogenized uh, based if their stability maintains, uh, again, they'll have the same properties. So looking a little bit more at the life cycle plan, um, this sort of describes what I just talked about a little bit more detail. That one uh, container of bulk was actually used as our in-house primary sample as well as our high concentration sample. Of course, some of this bulk is what uh, the folks doing neutron scattering and high concentration work are actually using as the primary sample. Uh, the rest of the bulk was mixed into uh, the standard lot, which can then be diluted into individual commercial lots. So when I talk about the life cycle plan, what I'm really talking about is uh, having sort of a traceable set of physical materials that we can actually compare our analytical methods to. So again, our large scale characterization effort initially was done on primary sample 8670. So in theory, this is the material that we know most about. This is the material that we've used the most and we use this material every time we run one of our analytical assays as a system suitability sample, at least initially. What we then did is essentially use the primary sample in our measurement infrastructure as our in-house standard. We use that to qualify um, one of the lots of materials are working lot. So now when we run day-to-day -day measurements, we always run this working lot of material at the start and at the end of our analytical sequence. So this tells us that our analytical method needs to perform in accordance with our historical uh, method performance data in order to say that that method is in fact controlled, in control. Once that's the case, we can then measure whatever uh, monoclonal antibody we want in the middle, uh, any other samples of NISMAB or produced NISMAB or external materials, and we know that our method is performing. Now, again, we'll still use uh, this primary sample 8670 when we do our stability verification, and now we use this as our system suitability material to say that our method is still in control, and we can again use that to qualify new materials of uh, commercial lots of material as necessary, or again, do stability monitoring. So, Essentially, the working reference lot is sort of our day-to-day -day, uh, system suitability control. But we, when we need to evaluate uh, reference assignments or assign new values to a new lot, we'll actually make sure our methods are in control with our primary sample, which again, is our in-house only material. So fortunately, if that didn't uh, make any sense at all, uh, you can actually read about it in a number of the papers. So. The life cycle plan is actually described in detail uh, as part of this series of five publications that uh, we did in analytical and bioanalytical chemistry. Uh, these are all open access uh, journals. But essentially what this describes is that long-winded life cycle plan that I tried to uh, get out of one slide a moment ago. It also then discusses the qualification where we took the purity and stability indicating methods, at least a select number of them, from the ACS books we further developed them and qualified them in the next two publications. So this includes things like CIEF, uh, which is used for charge characterization, oh. capillary zone electrophoresis that's used for charge heterogeneity, a number of size heterogeneity based methods. So capillary electrophoresis, uh, SDS. So this is basically looking at fragments of the material, size exclusion chromatography, which looks at aggregates, 
dynamic light scattering for uh, hydrodynamic radius and MFI or microfluidic imaging to look at particles of the monoclonal antibody. Of course, we also developed a uh, well-characterized peptide map uh, that has a robust digestion procedure uh, that can be used to verify the identity of the molecule. And then we used all of these methods in a value assignment to actually assign values to those three individual lots of material. So essentially, we have, have a life cycle plan, qualified a variety of analytical methods that are stability and purity indicating, and then we assigned those values to the NISMAB, again, using that measurement infrastructure that I described on the previous page. The values then for this assignment are available uh, online using this reference material information sheet. Again, each lot of materials that comes out will have its own set of assigned values, but it's worth noting that again, most of these are going to be equivalent. And in this last paper, we actually verified the equivalence of the first three lots. So we do actually assign specific values based on the measurements, but statistically uh, they are the same molecule as they should be because we did that homogenization uh, as part of the life cycle plan. So stability monitoring is, of course, extremely valuable to these uh, materials. So, of course, if you have the NIST map today and you have the NIST map in five years, the hope is that you're getting the same material. So we do a consistent stability monitoring program, and we actually update and verify our uh, public reference material information sheet uh, at least every five years, although we're doing a number of these measurements pretty consistently in our lab. So we're also sort of continuously monitoring the stability of this material. So this is a very complex process when we do sort of our formal evaluation. Uh, it involves getting instrumentation, a homogeneous sampling of, of the remaining sample in the lots. So we typically get about 10 different vials of material across uh, the entire lot. We have to organize our analysts um, and really kind of then facilitate uh, data collection. So the data collection analysis, we actually do this for all of the property values that are on the reference material information sheet. So this is each of the methods that I showed in the previous slide. Those methods, of course, as I'd mentioned, must conform to performance standards. So this is using a method-specific uh, instrument qualification standard, as well as that primary sample 8671 to assure that the system is suitable. Um, so we essentially go through data collection, again, of uh, numerous samples uh, that are um, selected throughout the lot. We document each of this with internal reports, and there's actually going to be a uh, external report uh, coming out very soon that's a much more detailed uh, NIST special publication that talks about all the details of this stability monitoring um, for at least our five-year uh, time point. This then goes through a series of submissions and reviews, internal paperwork, um, evaluation of the statistics by our, our uh, statistical department, and ultimately what you see is, again, an updated version uh, of that reference material information sheet. Now, of course, what we hope in the stability monitoring is that all values are consistent with the original value assignment, no values have changed, um, and the material is stable and homogeneous. And this, in fact, was the uh, conclusion after five years, of course, that all of our methods uh, are still in check and we still have a very stable uh, and homogeneous molecule. So just to go through a little bit of an example of what one of these analytical methods look like, um, this is one analytical method that I sort of uh, preach that everyone should run, especially if they're storing their material for long terms, if their measurement is a very long, long measurement, uh, doing something like sec pre and post can assure that there's no degradation, um, but essentially making sure that the uh, molecule is not aggregated. So size exclusion chromatography is a separation-based technique that's done uh, based on size. So essentially, smaller molecules can get into the pores of particles. Larger molecules are excluded. So larger molecules come out of the chromatography column a little bit earlier. We're calling these high molecular weight species. So this is dimers and trimers and tetramers. The monomer is, of course, that single uh, individual antibody that we show in all the beautiful pictures. And then we have a small peak of low molecular weight species that are fragments of the molecule. So think split off light chains um, and other clips and degradation species. This is actually just a buffer peak and isn't associated with a protein. So what we say here is that uh, when we're running size exclusion chromatography, uh, we actually have a table here of our original assigned values. So the values have a size heterogeneity, so the monomeric purity, 
the relative proportion of high molecular weight species and low molecular weight species in uncertainty uh, with that measurement that was evaluated over multiple days, multiple users, multiple columns to get a very robust understanding of the measurement position. And then we have a control uh, factor. Uh, so essentially the expanded uncertainty is the combined uncertainty. Think of a one standard deviation multiplied by three and that's where you get your control limit or the expanded uncertainty. So talking about how we're going to evaluate the stability of this molecule. Essentially, we're going to say that the property value should stay unchanged when they are the mean plus or minus three standard deviations, which is essentially this expanded uncertainty. So when we run our value assignment, again, we'll use an instrument specific uh, qualification sample. So this is unrelated to the instrument. It doesn't require any sample pre preparation and it's not the antibody but really just test the performance of the instrument. We'll then use our primary sample 8670 as a system suitability. So this will have any, any sample preparation, true handling of the material, and really be representative of the specific material, the, the reference material, because it is nominally the same identity. And then we'll run the reference material uh, itself that we're evaluating the stability. So our injection sequence is essentially IQ, system suitability, a number of samples of reference material, and we follow that again with an end of day check of the system suitability and the IQ. Ultimately, what we hope to see, and this is just the plot of, again, this is just our five-year stability. Uh, we can see the individual data points um, from an early set. Again, these are running triplicate, but um, an evaluation of the uh, zero year or the time of value assignment and then an evaluation of the five-year data you can see plotted. We have our mean of the original value assignment, as well as our plus or minus three standard deviations. And just like any three to control chart, again, if your values are within the standard uncertainty, uh, your material conforms to expectation with that uh, particular property value. So again, we show that our IQ standard, our system suitability, all within the expanded uncertainty, um, so we therefore can say that this material is homogeneous and stable with respect to uh, this property value. So again, we're continuously monitoring these samples. Uh, we're running our working samples uh, as part of our normal research uh, work as well. Uh, but this is just sort of our formal uh, five-year stability verification uh, that's required to assure that the material maintains its homogeneity uh, and stability to assure that, again, our stakeholders are getting a stable, uh, continuously maintained product. So we also have a, a number of resources available. Um, so uh, Katarina's mentioned this uh, in her talk, I believe, uh, at the, uh, the national meeting for links. Um, so the NISMAB resource portal is somewhere where uh, everyone can sort of go to get certain information about the material. Uh, so you can always go back to a program summary that's on the NIST main page. Uh, that we're updating uh, actually at the moment. Uh, but you can also look at the featured publications. So this is really the ACS books, the ABC publications. These are sort of the things that I talked about that are related to uh, the life cycle and quality of the material. But we also have a list of publications of the NISMAB that are uh, continuously being updated. Um, so this is any publication that someone published the word NISMAB one word or NIST space map two words. Uh, so we sort of cover all of the ground. Um, but this is where you can really go to quickly find a list of, of who's publishing what uh, on the NIST map, both internally and externally, um, and sort of really see the full uh, list of, of uh, publications coming out of that. In addition, there's this frequently uh, asked questions page that has uh, a number of sort of commonly asked questions related to uh, formulation um, and other things that uh, might come up quite often. The NIST map. So one of the ways that NIST has actually used the material uh, is through technology maturation. So again, I'd mentioned that NIST has a very uh, large program and a wide variety of analytical measurement techniques, um, everything from biological activity all the way to this uh, very, very detailed characterization of higher order structure with neutron scattering, cryo-EM, NMR, and even very detailed multi-attribute mass spectrometry. So again, I've talked about this a number of times that technology really matures. Um, you know, separation in science started with only gels. Not to say that gels aren't still important in understanding molecular properties, but 
you know, this has advanced a lot now to capillary-based methods and these really high-resolution analytical techniques. So our measurement infrastructure is really focused on uh, sort of evolving these analytical measurements and trying to better understand a number of these really high resolution characterization technologies. So one of the ways that we've utilized the material internally is to essentially identify an analytical measurement that is evolving, offers a lot of value to the community if it does advance, but maybe it needs still needs a little bit of harmonization, maybe the ability to make those measurements accurately and precisely across labs broadly isn't quite known yet, so we'll essentially recruit a number of participants throughout industry, academia, uh, and federal labs, depending on the study. Um, we'll write a very rigorous analytical protocol, uh, often trying to uh, minimize an, as many uh, points of uncertainty in a measurement chain as possible. So for example, when we did a triptych digest in the multi-attribute method consortium, we actually did the digest at NIST to take that variability out and only had the participants run the samples that were pre-made for them on their measurement system. And we even defined the chromatography conditions uh, of the separation. So we tried to harmonize a lot of aspects of that study. So each of these individual labs are then uh, blinded. So uh, they can submit their data back to NIST knowing that uh, we're not sort of ranking who is making measurements better than, than the other, but it's fully blinded, fully anonymized. And we can then look at the data from the study and better understand how the community is performing on an individual method. So we can really cross compare, um, you know, understanding the performance across laboratories, across instrumentation. So when we really say accuracy and precision, it's not just in one lab, but broadly, how is the community performing? This allows us to identify gaps in analytical methods for further development. Um, it allows us to actually provide feedback to those labs that might be just implementing a new technology, because even though the data is blinded to us, they can see how well they performed in comparison to their peers. And so they can sort of better understand where they are um, in comparison to other, um, other companies. So this sort of allows folks to evolve their analytical measurements, better understand their analytical measurements. It's all done in anonymized, blinded fashion. Uh, but it really does start to inform on uh, performance metrics of uh, these new and emerging methods and helps to sort of evolve them as a community. So I'll point you to a uh, review that uh, Katerina and our team uh, recently wrote uh, that came out in a special edition um, of Frontiers in Molecular Bioscience that really summarizes uh, the outputs of each of these four studies. And then, of course, if you're an expert in one of these methods, really diving in uh, to some of these results I think could be uh, of interest to you. But the real point of this slide is to say that our interlaboratory studies are extremely rigorous. We try to define the uh, measurement technologies and the needs as much as possible, and really try to understand the, the depth of these measurements and their capability uh, to try to evolve them into the next stage. So I think I'm gonna skip a couple uh, slides so that we can um, answer questions, but uh, those are really digging into the mass spectrometry study that uh, Trina Neuschauer and our group led uh, recently. Um, but just to say that these round robins really do have um, a lot of participation from biopharmaceutical companies, instrument vendors, regulatory agencies, and even the software vendors that are helping to uh, try to develop these methods. Uh, the new peak detection study, this was actually a, a mass spectrometry-based study, and we have a second publication that came out year, uh, this year on this study. Um, it has about 100 contributors to the individual publication. So, um, you know, the, the data acquisition and data analysis is, is, of course, a daunting task, but getting a publication through a legal review of 20 or 30 companies, I think, is equally challenging. Uh, but, of course, we managed to do that because this is all done in a pre-competitive, uh, non-IP space, it's all blinded. And that's why we're able to really get this sort of big group data out into the world to better understand these methods. And I think that that really is invaluable. So kind of the conclusion of all of this is the NIST map, we've characterized it both internally to NIST, externally, and a lot of people are using and publishing on this on this material. So, one of the questions I get a, I ask a lot when I'm out is, uh, what makes the NIST map so valuable and useful to the community? Why should I use the NIST map? What is valuable about it? Well, 
I don't really say what's so valuable, but you know, it's the who, right? And what really makes the NIST map valuable is the community. The folks that are making analytical measurements that are understanding the properties of the material and using that to advance biotechnology, that's really why the NIST map is so valuable. Because if we look at the report on all of the publications, all of the value that folks have actually uh, used the material for, there's of course been a number of interlaboratory studies, both organized by NIST and organized by external consortia. There's been the three books we've talked about, a wide variety of patent applications that actually use the material, for example, developing a new analytical method, and it's been featured in a number of uh, application notes by instrument vendors to essentially show off the performance of their analytical methods. So it really is the use of this material, I think, the foundational characterization, but every time someone makes a measurement on the NISMAB material, it benefits the entire community and it really does make um, the, the sort of ecosystem more important and more valuable uh, to evolving biopharmaceuticals. So uh, every time you make a, a measurement on the NISMAB, I, I really do think that uh, it's evolving the landscape. So there's still a lot to do, uh, of course. So biomanufacturing, of course, you know, I show this as a biological input cell going into bioreactor, purifying and formulating. And this sounds like a nice, easy process, but there's so much that we can still improve, intensify to try to get value out of these materials. So not only monoclonals, of course, they still need intensified processes to combat things like uh, the coronavirus and other emerging uh, viruses of pandemic potential to get the scale, the speed to get antibodies available for use that actually can be uh, very uh, highly effective. But all of these other materials that are being developed have a lot of measurement needs that are very similar. Adoptive cell therapies, mRNA vaccines, um, and viral vectors all share a lot of the same measurement needs to understand identity, potency, purity, uh, and stability. In addition to that, there's of course a large amount of bioprocess measurement. So again, we need to start thinking about moving analytical measurements more online to make things faster. There's modeling and simulation of these products. There's still a lot to understand about the formulation, especially at very high concentration, um, and a lot of modeling and digital twinning to be done in the bioprocess. So safe to say that while the, the industry is very well developed, there's still a lot that can be done. And I'm very thankful that Lynx is uh, using the NIST map and tackling, you know, one of, I think, one of the most challenging uh, portions of this is really understanding that macro scale uh, dynamics of the molecules and how that relates to formulation and stability. And again, having that data set available to the community is going to be a, a, a huge opportunity, I think, um, for developing new modeling and simulation methods. Um, I was mentioning to Mikhail that literally just this week, we got a question about how sticky is the NIST map and you know, how can we better understand those properties of the materials. So uh, again, I think we're in a great space uh, with this consortium and uh, very happy that you all are working on that. So the global conclusion is, um, you know, we at NIST really want to help the, to, to refine and uh, help evolve analytical test methods. And we do that of course, in collaboration with uh, everyone in the ecosystem. Um, so really those NIST measurement tools and reference materials, of course, being central to uh, innovation and quality are really done in collaboration uh, with a wide variety of folks. Um, and hopefully we can use that to implement and accelerate uh, the, ver the variety of treatment options available. So of course, if there are um, acknowledgements, um, there are so many people to acknowledge, of course, all the folks that have made measurements on the NIST map. Uh, the NIST map team that's involved uh, in the certification and recertification process um, are web developers at IBBR. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, there are so many people to uh, thank, uh, including a couple, uh, Daryl Davis and Oleg Borisov, who uh, really helped lead the book project with me. Um, and a number of other folks throughout uh, the history of the NIST map that uh, have been really invaluable in, in making the material what it is today. So with that, uh, feel free to uh, reach out to Kat or I if you have questions on the material um, at any point in time. Uh, we've also set up this kind of general uh, email NIST map at NIST.gov. Um, but of course, you all know uh, Kat and I, if you have questions about the material, feel free to reach out. Um, and with that, I'd be uh, happy to open up to questions. Uh, I think I left a little bit of time. And thank you all for having me.